观众朋友们好，现在是美国东部时间三月八日，这里是《华尔街网报》当日第三期节目。现在我们继续为您带来有关俄乌局势的最新消息。首先是一条突发新闻：克里姆林宫宣布，普京签署有关于限制产品和原材料进出俄罗斯法令，将在十二月三十一日前禁止向俄罗斯联邦以外的地区出口任何产品和原材料。克里姆林宫在声明中没有详细说明这一份原材料和产品清单中是否有例外，目前不知是否包括能源。在这样的消息宣布之后，白宫官员随即发表声明表示：“我们无法预计普京的下一个步骤或者十多个步骤，但是我们已经为一切做好了准备。”而同时，俄罗斯财政官员表示，现已向有关单位提出要求，将建立属于俄罗斯自己的加密货币交易网络。目前没有提供更多细节。Um, first of all, what's your assessment of how many Russian soldiers have thus far been killed、um, and how many injured?、Uh, and based on your experience、uh, with Putin, what would it take to change Putin's calculus in Ukraine? <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.、Um, I think Putin is determined to dominate and control Ukraine to shape its orientation.、Um, you know, this is a matter of deep personal conviction for him. He's been stewing in a combustible combination of grievance and ambition for many years.、Um, that personal conviction matters more than ever in the Russian system. He's created a system in which his own circle of advisors is narrower and narrower. COVID has made that even narrower,、um, and it's a system in which it's not proven career-enhancing for people to question or challenge his judgment. So he's gone to war, I think, on the basis, Mr. Chairman, of A number of assumptions, which led him to believe that he faced, that Russia faced, a favorable landscape for the use of force against Ukraine this winter. First, that Ukraine, in his view, was weak and easily intimidated. Second, that the Europeans, especially the French and Germans, were distracted by elections in France and a leadership succession in Germany and risk averse. Third, he believed he had sanctions proofed his economy. Um, in, in the sense of creating a large war chest of foreign currency reserves, and fourth, he was confident that he had modernized his military and they were capable of a quick, decisive victory at minimal cost.、Um, he's been proven wrong on every count. Those assumptions have proven to be profoundly flawed over the last 12 days of conflict. President Zelensky, as, as you've mentioned, Mr. Chairman, as the ranking member mentioned. Um, has risen to the moment and demonstrated courageous and remarkable leadership, and Ukrainians have resisted fiercely.、Um, second,、um, the Europeans have demonstrated remarkable resolve,、um, especially the Germans. Third,、uh, the economic consequences of the sanctions which have been enacted so far have proven to be devastating for Russia, especially against the Russian central bank. Um, depriving Putin of the ability that he assumed he'd have to defend the ruble, and fourth, his own military's performance has been largely ineffective. Instead of seizing Kiev within the first two days of the campaign, which was what his plan was premised upon, after nearly two weeks, they still have not been able to fully encircle the city. And so, you know, Putin has has commented privately and publicly over the years that he doesn't believe Ukraine's a real country. He's dead wrong about that. Real countries fight back, and that's what the Ukrainians have done quite heroically over the last 12 days.、Um, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I think Putin is angry and frustrated right now. He's likely to double down and try to grind down the Ukrainian military with no regard for civilian casualties. But the challenge that he faces, and this is the biggest question that's hung over our analysis of his planning for months now. As the director, as Director Haines said, is he has no sustainable political endgame in the face of what is going to continue to be fierce resistance from Ukrainians. So I think that's what his calculus、um, has been, and I think the that's the reality of what he faces today. In terms of casualties, I, I know、uh, General Barry may want to comment on that, but there have been far in excess Russian military casualties, killed and wounded, far in excess of what he anticipated, because his. Military planning and assumptions was premised on a quick, decisive victory,、um, and、uh, that has not proven to be the case. Director Barry, are you able, are you able to comment on that? And also,、um, this massive column、uh, heading toward Kiev, and maybe two massive columns. 
Um, public reports suggest that they've run out of fuel. Um, are we learning that the Russian military is uh, far less competent than we imagine? Um, how do you assess their performance thus far? Chairman, I, I think the, uh, the Russian army reformed into this thing we call the New Look Army. And they, they task organized themselves into smaller battalion tactical groups. And fundamentally, that, that is not a bad uh, construct. I think they had a bad plan. And I think their <clears throat> logistic support is not what it needs to be to, uh, to develop the situation that they wanted to do. And we, we can go into much more detail on that in, in the closed session. Are you, are you able to say in open session how many uh, Russian troops have been killed? With, with low confidence, uh, somewhere between two and 4,000. That number comes from some intelligence sources, but also open source uh, and how we pull that together. Um, Director Burns, whatever Putin's plan may have been on the way in, um, if that plan involved the, the installation of a puppet regime, that seems highly implausible now. Um, how does this end? Um, well, that's the core question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think Putin's assumptions, as I said before, have turned out to be profoundly flawed. I failed to see, and our analysts failed to see, how he could sustain a puppet regime or a you know, pro-Russian leadership that he tries to install in the face of what is you know, massive opposition from the Ukrainian people. In many ways, it's been Putin's aggression, going back to 2014 in Crimea, that's created the strong sense of Ukrainian nationhood and sovereignty that he faces today. So I, I fail to see how he can produce that kind of an endgame. And where that leads, I think, is, is for an ugly next few weeks in which he doubles down, as I said before, with scant regard for civilian casualties in which urban fighting can get even uglier. Because the one thing I'm absolutely convinced of, and I think our analysts across the intelligence community are absolutely convinced of, is the Ukrainians are going to continue to resist fiercely and effectively. Representative Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I share with all of my colleagues uh, really bipartisan support for the extraordinary leadership you've all shown. And I know you've been working long hours, and we're deeply grateful to you. Um, I, I want to associate myself with Mr. Fitzpatrick's comments. I believe that the American people think we need to do more. And to call this unprovoked is, is actually um, modest. It is premeditated. It is savage. It is unconscionable brutality. And we're going to watch a genocide happen in Ukraine if we don't create our own red lines. So I guess um, I'd like to start with you, Director Burns, because you know Vladimir Putin better than probably anyone else in this room. Um, he's already said he has a red line, which is the economic sanctions. That, that, that was, um, you know, the beginning of World War III. What, he, he clearly wants to recreate the Soviet Union and pick up all the, the Balkan states. Why are we somehow reluctant to recognize that he's willing to go as far as he needs to go? Well, Congresswoman, I think... You know, Putin's actions, especially in the last two weeks, and they have been premeditated and they have been savage, just as you described, I think should remove any doubt about, you know, the depth of his determination, not just with regard to Ukraine, but in terms of you know, he, how he exercises Russian power. I would, however, say that what he's been met with since then, first and foremost by Ukrainians themselves and their courage and their heroism and the strength of their leadership, um, has surprised and unsettled him. I think he's been unsettled by the Western reaction and allied resolve, particularly some of the decisions the German government has taken. Um, I think he's been unsettled by the performance of his own military. I guess, excuse me for interrupting, sure. but do you, knowing as much as you know about him, he's not going to stop at Ukraine, correct? Well, I think that's what makes it um, more important than ever to demonstrate that he's not going to succeed in Ukraine. Um, and, and I think that's what the challenge is uh, for all of us, because what's at stake is more, as important as Ukraine's sovereignty is, what's at stake is more than that. It's about an a, a incredibly important uh, rule in international order that big countries don't get to swallow up small countries just because they can. 
And I think this is one of those pivotal points where we and all of our allies and partners need to act on that. And okay. I think that's what we're doing. Thank you. Um, 观众朋友们好，现在是美国东部时间三月八日，这里是《华尔街网报》当日第五期节目。现在我们继续为您关注到的仍然是俄乌局势的最新消息。首先来看到的是来自国际原子能机构的紧急通报：联合国核监督机构表示，安装在乌克兰附近切尔诺贝利核电站的保障监督系统的远程数据传输现已丢失，但是没有给出更多的情况。此前，《华尔街网报》已向您介绍，俄罗斯总统普京签署了有关于在外国经济活动领域实施措施、禁止出口的有关决定。而来自俄新社的报道介绍了更详细的情况。普京将在某一些对外经济活动领域实施特殊经济措施，以确保所谓俄罗斯联邦安全。而普京将指示在两天内确定禁止进口某些产品和原材料的国家。以及类别名单，他还表示要确保在十二月三十一日前禁止从俄罗斯出口这一些产品和原材料。分析普遍认为，名单可能会不会包括石油和天然气。如果俄罗斯阻止石油和天然气的出口，那么价格将出现惊人的波动。再为您关注到的是来自美国媒体 Axios 的独家报道。文章引述以色列官员表示，俄罗斯和乌克兰之间的停火谈判处在关键时期。以色列因为与乌克兰和俄罗斯都有较好的关系，可以在两国之间进行调停，因此处于十分特殊的角色中。根据来自 Axios 的报道，对以色列协调会谈有直接了解的以色列官员透露，他们感到在过去二十四小时之内，双方的立场都出现了软化。俄罗斯方面表示，只想使顿巴斯地区非军事化。而此前，泽伦斯基告诉 ABC 新闻，他对加入北约的态度已经冷静降温了。以色列官员向美国媒体 Axios 透露，他们希望这一些迹象表明有可能在外交解决方面取得更多的进展。此前，《华尔街网报》向您介绍，以色列总理在秘密的情况下，在周六访问了莫斯科，与普京会面长达三个小时。此后，他又与泽伦斯基、法国总统马克龙以及德国总理肖尔茨进行了一连串的电话交谈。在今天，贝内特再次与泽伦斯基谈及停火，然后又打电话给普京，转达乌克兰方面的信息。克里姆林宫则表示，普京向贝内特介绍了俄罗斯和乌克兰在白俄举行第三轮会谈的情况。两位以色列官员向 Axios 透露，贝内特并没有向普京和泽伦斯基提出任何计划或者是框架，仅仅是在两位领导人之间传递信息。以色列官员也表示，在与普京的会谈中，贝内特转述来自乌克兰和其他国家，包括德国和法国的想法，以看看普京的反应，并评估他对目前的停火条件是否有灵活空间。贝内特和他的助手向乌克兰、拜登政府、法国和德国也详细介绍了普京会面的情况。以色列官员认为，他们与普京的会谈为泽伦斯基理清了局势，也有助于帮助西方了解普京的立场。以色列官员表示。以色列向美国、法国和德国都传达了普京向泽伦斯基提议的细节，而华盛顿、巴黎和柏林对此并不完全了解。以色列官员表示，普京的提议让泽伦斯基难以接受，但是并不像他们预期的那样极端。该提案不包括基辅的政权更迭，允许乌克兰保持其主权。以色列高级官员表示，泽伦斯基处在十字路口，必须在两个选项中做出抉择。要么就是接受俄罗斯的提议，该提议非常强硬，但是可以维护乌克兰的主权并停止战争。如果拒绝提议，将冒着俄罗斯攻击严重升级的风险，这可能会给泽伦斯基和乌克兰带来下一步的危机。以色列官员表示，现在以色列和其他西方国家不打算迫使乌克兰选择一条特定的道路，但是他们表示担心，如果会谈失败，战争将进入一个新的、更加暴力的阶段，普京的提议将被彻底拿下。恢复谈判将变得不再可能。再为您关注到的是跟波兰有关的消息。根据来自路透社的报道，波兰外交部在周二表示，波兰准备将其所有的米格二十九喷气机都部署到德国空军基地供美国使用，并敦促拥有该类型飞机的其他北约成员国也这样做。该部门表示，波兰共和国当局准备立即免费将其所有的米格二十九喷气机部署到拉姆施泰因空军基地，将其交付给美国政府处置。与此同时，波兰要求美国向我们提供具有相应作战能力的飞机。波兰准备立即确定购买飞机的条件。
。根据来自路透社的报道，波兰现在正在用防御性武器支持基辅，但是此前表示不会向乌克兰派遣战机，原因是他并不是乌克兰与俄罗斯之间直接冲突的当事方。莫拉维茨基总理在周二在奥斯陆与挪威总理举行的联合发布会上表示，任何有关于提供进攻性武器的决定都必须由整个北约在一致基础上做出。他补充表示，这就是为什么我们准备将所有的喷气式战斗机机队交给拉姆施泰因。我们不准备自己采取任何行动，因为正如我们所说，我们并不是这一场战争的另外一方。而美国方面则对波兰提出为乌克兰战争提供战机的努力表示惊讶，表示波兰方面此前并没有通知过有关决定，而是直接宣布了相关决定。Uh, in 2019, the director Coates said that Russia and China were more aligned、uh, than at any point since the mid 1950s, and the relationship is likely to strengthen.、Uh, Director Haynes, let me ask you: Do you believe that's still the case? Was it more the case before this invasion? Has this changed that calculus? And、uh, do we believe that Beijing is looking at this、uh, as surprised, perhaps, as Putin was of the Western response? Thank you,、uh, Representative. I think Director Coates was exactly right. I believe that it continues to be the case that they are getting closer together. We see that across a range of, of sectors: economic, political, security,、um, and expect it to continue. I think there's a limit to which it will go, but、um, but nevertheless, that remains a concern. And in terms of the impact of the current crisis, I'd say that it、um, it's not yet clear to me exactly how it will affect the trajectory of their relationship. I think、uh, it's clear that that. China has not come out and criticized Russia for their actions, clearly, and yet at the same time, they did abstain, for example, in the context of the UN Security Council resolution and in other、uh, scenarios. And it does seem as if、um, they are potentially paying a price for not criticizing Russia, and that may have an impact on how this trajectory moves forward. But I think,、uh, in general, I think it does continue to. The two countries get closer together, and others may have thoughts. All, all I would add, Congressman, is I think Director Coates was right, and I think if anything, that relationship, the partnership between Russia and China, has strengthened since two thousand nineteen. I would add, though, that I, I I think the President Xi and the Chinese leadership are a little bit unsettled by what they're seeing in Ukraine. They did not anticipate. Uh, the, the significant difficulties the Russians were going to run into. I think they're unsettled by the reputational damage that can come by their close association with President Putin. Second, by the economic consequences at a moment when you know they're facing lower annual growth rates than they've experienced for more than three decades. I think they're a little bit unsettled about the impact on the global economy. And third, I think they're a little bit unsettled by. The way in which、uh, Vladimir Putin has driven Europeans and Americans much closer together. I think they've, you know, valued their relationship with Europe、um, and valued what they believe to be their capacity to try to drive wedges between us and the Europeans. And so I think that's unsettling for them as well. Mr. Crawford, thank you, Mr. Chairman.、Um, <clears throat> I'll address this to anybody on the panel that wants to. Answer the question or to discuss this, but China is investing billions of dollars. We know in its domestic、uh, semiconductor, semiconductor industry, in an attempt to achieve full chip independence by 2050. I'm wondering what the assessment of the likelihood of China fully indigenizing its chip industry by then. What sort of security threats would you assess China's increased chip independence creates, and how can the U.S. and its allies address those threats moving forward? So, Congressman, this is a, a very timely question, and、um, you know, as we look at China increasingly become more indigenous in their production, this has great concern for us. In terms of the the broader impacts, I, I would like to talk about this a little bit more this afternoon because I I can provide a, a depth I think that's、uh, very important for us to cover. Okay, thank you.、Uh, do you perceive a threat that the Chinese-made chips could also be exported abroad, or is this a topic that you just would rather discuss in the closed setting? If we can talk in close setting, that'd be great. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me shift gears then, and, and we'll we'll revisit that topic in the close setting.、Um, General Barrier, some experts have voiced concerns that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could embolden the PRC to pursue a full-scale invasion 
or military blockade to Taiwan. What's your assessment of the likelihood of a copycat effect, and what more can the U.S. do to prevent the crisis in Ukraine from being repeated in Taiwan? Congressman, I think Taiwan and Ukraine are two different two different things completely. I also I also believe that our deterrence posture in the Pacific puts a very different perspective on on all of this. I, we do know that that uh, the PRC watching very very carefully what happens and how this plays out uh, throughout the entire dime. Uh, and and I would address more of this in the close. From the U.S. President Mark Long, the U.S. President Schulz, having a video conference. Xi Jinping stated, "At the time of the global pandemic, it brought many challenges to the world. It needs a global approach to promote peace and cooperation. We need to take a common language. We need to take a common stand to maintain cooperation and to promote global relationships." 中国的发展将为中欧合作带和平。我们要呼吁保持最大限度克。克隆·舒尔茨表示，祝贺中方成功举办北京冬奥会，表示欧洲正面临二战以来最严重危机。当前乌克兰局势的看法和立场，我们要共同支持俄乌和谈，推动双方维护。Trilatéral avec le chancelier Scholz et moi-même dans cette période, nous puissions poursuivre les échanges dans ce cadre, qui est la continuité de ce format que nous avons mis en œuvre la discussion sur le, essentiellement la question ukrainienne, en mentionnant très rapidement le sujet. En tant que membre permanent du Conseil de sécurité, un rôle à jouer. 观众朋友们好，现在是美国东部时间三月八日，这里是《华尔街网报》当日第六期节目。现在我们继续为您带来的是俄乌局势的最新进展。首先来看到经济方面的突发消息：俄罗斯央行宣布，九月九日之前暂停销售外汇，而随即汇率降低了俄罗斯主权评级，表示债务违约在即。将俄罗斯主权评级从 B 进一步下调六个等级至 C， 表示债务违约已迫在眉睫。根据来自新闻引述俄新社的报道表示，俄罗斯银行宣布，在三月九日到九月九日，现金提取限制会限制在一万美元之内。通报指出，所有客户的外币账户或存款资金最多可以提取一万美元现金，其余的资金按照发放当天的市场汇率，全部只能提取卢布。公民可以继续在外币存款或账户中保留基金。说及经济有关的消息，再来看到的是来自《金融时报》的报道。据《金融时报》报道，中国现在作为俄罗斯最亲近的战略伙伴，双边贸易连接紧密。2月24日，俄罗斯入侵乌克兰以来，人民币波动较为有限，甚至对美元升值一度到近四年新高。文章分析认为，现在俄罗斯因为入侵乌克兰遭受了严酷的经济制裁，卢布大跌，但是人民币汇率较为稳定，让专家认为人民币可能成为地缘政治动荡下的俄罗斯避险工具。根据来自《金融时报》的分析，有几个指标显示，人民币在俄罗斯受到制裁的情况下，国际地位有所上升。渣打银行的分析报告表示，人民币全球化指标现在接近历史新高。而来自《金融时报》的文章则分析表示，中国可能有更大的野心，希望摆脱由西方主导的 SWIFT 系统。这也就是为什么北京一直致力发展人民币跨境支付等。系统目前在一百多个国家，一共有一千二百多个机构会员，实力与有一万一千多个会员的 SWIFT 还有明显的差距，但是比俄罗斯的类似系统已经高出很多。文章分析表示，受到国际制裁的俄罗斯恐怕必须求助于人民币跨境支付系统。文章引述专门研究国际货币关系的经济学家指出，对俄罗斯的制裁也会刺激伊朗、朝鲜和委内瑞拉减少美元持有。他表示，如果美国和盟友拿美元当武器，会给中国更多诱因，从中获利。根据来自《金融时报》的分析，中国之间有很多利益关联。俄罗斯是中国主要的石油和天然气供应源，而中俄从2014年开始致力于减少美元在双边贸易结算的占比
。俄罗斯央行数据显示， 2 0 2 0年第一季，美元在俄中贸易结算占比低于 50% 而卢布和人民币的总占比高达 25% 俄中贸易额近年还在上升。如果看到中国海关的数据，去年中俄贸易成长超过 33% 总额已将近 1,500 亿美元。在2月的时候，两国元首又表示要让双边贸易总额上 2,500 亿美元。金融时报介绍表示，人民币在俄罗斯的外汇储备举足轻重。俄罗斯央行一月报告显示，相当于七百三十亿美元，占到外汇存储总额百分之十三。专家表示，虽然活跃于国际市场的中国银行不急于伸出援手，但是中国仍然可以运用自身以人民币为基础的资金流通网络，包括与西方连接较弱的各国内银行，协助俄罗斯规避国际金融限制。整体而言，中国将谨慎评估各项风险。并且让维持与俄罗斯的关系，还有避免自己遭西方制裁之间获得平衡。In terms of real impact, it's quite a lot because、um, oil is not a local commodity; it is priced globally. So when you make a, a change in supply and demand dynamics, and when particularly you make a statement that the United States is supporting. Um, banning um, Russian fossil fuel sales、um, that has an enormous impact on the global oil markets, and if they have an impact on the global oil markets, they're going to have an impact on gas prices here at home. So it may not be a, a large amount physically, but from a practical point of view, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of prices. Let's say that we get to another place somewhere around where we were in 2008. We break highs of around $150 a barrel. That's、uh, a bit of a stretch, but let's say we go above that to $175 a barrel, which is about as as wild a number as I can imagine.、Uh, no matter what happens in Russia, so you can add another two dollars and get to somewhere around I don't know where where, where would you be? Six fifty a gallon. That to me is about the outside limit. You know, all of us talk about. You know, ten dollar gas, which, by the way, is what Europe generally deals with anyway.、Uh, I don't think is coming to this country. No, nothing near that. At this point, to target、uh, Russian oil and gas is an enormous ask from European governments. So、uh, they obviously have a, a very,、uh, they obviously have a larger stake in this, both politically and from a security point of view, as well as from an energy point of view. So. It's it's absolutely monumental that they should that the Americans that Biden would have gotten some support in this, even from、uh, Great Britain, but getting it from any European state at this point,、um, it's it's quite it's quite remarkable.、Uh, the ability of American、um, producers to、uh, to come in and and add more and and take advantage profitably of what's going on in the market. Is not really there, and even for OPEC and Saudi Arabia, who may have may have another million or two barrels that they could possibly put into the mix,、uh, they've waited quite a long time for a market where they could、uh, get back some of the money they've lost over the past five or six years. And、uh, I'm not saying that they won't add some supply here. I, I think that the Biden administration is going to very much want them to, and、uh, ask them as a, an ally to help them and do it. But、uh, I think that their initial、uh, thoughts would be, you know, I, we really need to bank on some profits while we can get them because we haven't seen any for quite a long time. Is the White House prepared for the oil price to go as high as two hundred dollars a barrel or something really, really high like that? And if so, what what preparations are you making? To help the American economy against that kind of a, a hit, we're neither going to make a prediction, or, nor are we going to tell Americans to stay home. What the president is focused on is taking a range of steps to mitigate the impact.、Uh, obviously, we've seen, as I noted a little bit earlier, an increase since President Putin invaded Ukraine of about seventy-five cents. That is,、uh, you know, over the course of the timeline,、uh, we've seen that、uh, in relation to,、uh, you know,、um, uh, concern in the oil in the global oil markets about what they're seeing, which is an invasion.、Uh, in, but we we believe that the impact of this、um, 
oil ban we announced today will be uh, not long term. And what we're working to do is to take steps to mitigate it, which is in part the release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, continuing to coordinate and communicate with uh, global energy suppliers and continuing to consider a range of options. So there are a range that we are considering. I'm not going to uh, give you a nod or a wink to any specifics other than to say that oh, come on. there are a range of options on the table. Uh, as you all know, we are engaging uh, in ongoing conversations with large global energy suppliers as a part of it. Part of that effort has also uh, been to, um, to, to, to do this um, coordinated release of what will be 90 million barrels uh, from the Strategic Petroleum, Res Petroleum Reserve excuse me, this uh, fiscal year, uh, including uh, the, in the initial uh, announcement and then the one we, we just made last week, I believe it was. So those conversations are ongoing. I would also note that part of our uh, the capacity out here is it is with the oil companies um, who have uh, these um, approved permits uh, that are unused uh, where they could do more. Now, some CEOs have indicated that they do plan to uh, increase production, and that's something that to meet the supply needs we have now, we certainly would welcome. Um, the steps we've seen in Texas and Florida are um, are uh, are deeply concerning and are having uh, are discriminating against exactly the kind of kids who we need to be loving and supporting. Um, and we've seen, and I reference Florida because, as you know, they just recently passed a similar hateful bill uh, that hurt uh, some of the students most in need. Um, in terms of any legal actions, I'd obviously point you to the Department of Justice, but I would just note that the President, the Secretary of Education, many members of the administration have spoken out about the discriminatory nature of these bills and our deep concerns about the message they're sending to LGBTQ kids and families. Speaker, Pane Premier Minister, Члени Уряду, Парламенту, Лорди, Леди та Джентльмени. Я звертаюся до усіх людей Сполучного Королівства, до усіх людей Великої Британії, великого народу, з великою історією. Я звертаюся до вас як громадянин, як президент, але теж великої країни, з великою мрією і великою боротьбою. Я хочу розказати вам про наші 13 днів. 13 днів війни, міцної війни, яку ми не розпочинали і не хотіли, але ведемо, тому що не хочемо втратити те, що в нас є, те, що наше, Україну, так само, як ви не хотіли втратити свій острів, коли нацисти готувалися розпочати битву за вашу велику державу, битву за Британію.